Thank you, Rachel, for reading uh, from that part of God's Word that we're now going to look at in a little more detail. Um, As we do so, we are, of course, utterly dependent upon the Holy Spirit to make this more than uh, just an intellectual exercise. It should be an intellectual exercise, as uh, we are able, but uh, we want it to be more than that, the working of God's Spirit amongst us. So let's pray and ask Him to do that. Our gracious God, we pray that as we open Your Word, Uh, the very words of you, the almighty God of heaven and earth, uh, that you would, by your grace and in the working of your spirit amongst us, speak to us, make your word clear, uh, encourage us in faithfulness to you to live as yours for your glory. Uh, Father, we pray this as your people, in the name of Jesus. Amen. A long, 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 long time ago, uh, when I was at school, if a boy went into the girls' uh, changing rooms or toilets, then the punishment was going to be very sudden and very severe. It would involve a strap or a cane and possibly suspension or even expulsion. Uh, Time moves on. About five years ago, not that long ago, Uh, Most mainstream Aussies were a little bit shocked, probably, when President Obama wrote to all schools in the US telling them that uh, children who declared themselves trans should be allowed into whichever bathroom they chose, whatever they thought fitted. How quickly things have changed. And now they've changed even more, haven't they? Uh, If you declare that you don't want a a boy in the local high school going into the same change room as your daughter, then you are the one who is accused, in some cases, not all cases yet, but in some cases of being the one who is unenlightened and, and immoral and simply a bigot and restricting that poor child from living uh, who he believes he is. What we see without having to point it out to you in great detail, because you know it, you're living in it, is that we live in a society that in many ways is in a rampant rebellion against God, isn't it? What is good according to God is declared to be evil. And those who try to stand for what is good and holy and pure themselves, they are the ones who are declared by our society, that is, hopefully you and me, uh, we are the ones who are declared to be evil. Uh, We have a very interesting path ahead of us, don't we, if these trends continue unabated. But uh, the passage of Scripture that we look at today speaks directly at these things within our society. It reassures us that this isn't a new trend within society, uh, and it tells us how we should respond to the ugliness of the world. And it finishes with reassuring us of the blessedness of simply trusting God and trusting his word, even when we are vilified and scorned and despised and abused in the process. If you have your Bible open there to uh, Luke chapter 11 and starting at uh, verse 14, you see there that uh, Jesus uh, receives some very, very powerful prejudice against him, doesn't he? Because what does Jesus do? He does something which is undeniably good, doesn't he? What does he do? He goes to a man who is unable to speak and he heals that man uh, of what the scripture tells us there is demonic activity. Now, whether it was obvious to others around that were seeing it, that it was demonic or not, what they could see clearly was this man could not speak And now he can because of the actions of the Lord Jesus. So what is bad about that? In verse 14, it tells us that the crowd was amazed or the people marveled at what had happened. Everybody had seen it and it's undeniably good, isn't it? No man, no no person doubts that this man has been helped in a wonderful way. But what happens? What is the response? Some people in the crowd, it tells us, uh, that they turn even this good work, this undeniably good work of the Lord Jesus against him and declare 
that, okay, it might on the outside seem good, but the only reason he has achieved this good work is because Jesus himself is evil. Jesus is acting by the power of Beelzebub, by the power of Satan himself. And what is very clear from looking at this first verse is that in a very compact way, it's telling us that they weren't coming to Jesus on a neutral stance, were they? They were powerfully prejudiced against Jesus. Uh, they weren't re neutral in re their reactions towards him. And so even that which is good, they want to cast as being from evil motives. And it's more than just a failure in logic, isn't it? In just a few words, Luke makes it very clear to us that there is here a definite uh, spiritual blindness within the audience. They see and they are amazed, he tells us. And yes, they certainly should be amazed that this man can talk again. But then what do they do? They assign uh, their own made-up motives. And then in verse 16, what do they do? It's quite incredible. They ask for a sign from heaven. Now, surely that's astounding, isn't it? What did they just see? Why were they amazed? They were am amazed because Jesus did what God alone can do. And he did it by his own authority and he did it by his own power. If that's not a sign from heaven, then what is a sign from heaven? But they're not the first ones to do this and it's not even just the enemies of the Lord Jesus who have been guilty of doing this. Uh, remember when the disciples of John the Baptist approached Jesus and they asked him if he was the one to come or if they should expect someone else. Remember, John was in jail and he was probably feeling a bit discouraged and wondering where things were going. Things hadn't turned out the way that he, he thought they would, and so he was having a few doubts himself. Uh, we can read about this back a couple of chapters in Luke chapter 7. And uh, look what it says there in Luke chapter 7 and verse 22. <clears throat> uh, in verse 22, And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up. The poor of good news preach to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. You see, the disciples of John had seen all that stuff, but it was, I guess, just not connecting with them for a moment somehow. And they just needed to be reminded about, about the signs that they had seen. Well, these enemies of Jesus certainly needed that, didn't they? They needed to have their eyes opened to what was happening before their very eyes, because these things are, in fact, signs. Uh, last week, we read from Isaiah 35, and maybe we should have read it again today. Uh, you can read it again later if you want to. But in Isaiah 35, in verses 5 and 6, it says, Then, speaking of the day when the Saviour would come, then... Will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped? Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue, this is the story we're talking about, the mute tongue shout for joy. And so the signs are promised and uh, Jesus is saying the signs are here, just take notice of them. And Jesus literally fulfills to the letter those signs and it's plain for everyone to see apart from those who are blindfolded, who cannot, who will not see. I'm not sure I need to, to labour this point. It seems so clear and so obvious. But just pretend uh, that uh, we, we, uh, you and I come to an arrangement and I say, uh, OK, I'll come around to your place and um, pick you up. Uh, be around about... Um, half past nine, and uh, we'll head off to church together. When I get into your drive, I'll hoot, uh, toot the horn, and you'll hear that I, I'm there, and you'll come out. And so you're there, uh, you're waiting for me to come, you're waiting for me to come, you're waiting for me to come. Bang on, half past nine, you hear a toot, and you get angry, and you say, what's that idiot tooting in my driveway for? Well, this is the sign that we've agreed on. And this is surely what has happened here. Uh, God himself has given the sign. He's declared it. He's even written it down so that his people would remember. 
And he comes along and he gives the sign and he says, this is all happening, folks. This is the savior of the world coming into the world. And these are the things that we spoke about. They're happening like we agreed they would. Here are the signs. See it. And yet they don't hear. They don't see. They even react with anger about what Jesus is doing. We've been seeing these signs all the way through the Gospel of Luke, haven't we? If you go back to the uh, very first verses of Luke chapter 1 and verse 1, uh, Luke tells us that this is uh, actually what he's really on about. He is uh, wanting to present to Theophilus the things that have been fulfilled among them. He's saying, Theophilus, uh, you know your stuff, you know what the Old Testament has promised. Well, here it is. Here it is right in the present. Here it is uh, right happening before your eyes. And so the glory of the Lord Jesus is being revealed. Sometimes through more mundane things like the healing of this mute man. Uh, sometimes in the more spectacular ways of the, the uh, a couple of chapters ago when we looked at the transfiguration. That was uh, months and months and months ago is when I last preached here on that, that passage. Uh, but the glory of the Lord Jesus unveiled that, that, uh, so that Peter and James and John could see who he is. The one who is full of glory and grace and truth. Uh, the longed for saviour of his people. But here we see the, the contrast of that glory revealed and the contrast to that, to the darkness of those who simply will not see. And, and so instead of uh, seeing the sign, they themselves become part of a different sign, a dreadful sign, a sign of people bringing God's judgment on themselves. Uh, this also is fulfillment of the Old Testament. In uh, Jeremiah, many places we could look, but Jeremiah 5 and verse 18 and following, for example, Jeremiah says, Yet in those days, declares the Lord, and he says lots of things in judgment about those who, uh, in, in these days. Uh, and in verse 21, it says, Hear this, you foolish and senseless people, who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not do not hear. Now we're in no way denying that there are intellectual questions that can be asked and uh, should be asked and should be dealt with in regard to the Lord Jesus. Uh, how we can believe in his resurrection, how we can believe that these signs are real, etc., etc., etc. But the ultimate problem, the ultimate problem that causes people to not accept the Lord Jesus is not an intellectual one. It's a moral one. It's a spiritual one. They will not see. They do not want to see. And this is our world, isn't it? This is the world we live in. This is the experience of you as a Christian in your workplace. Uh, and what are you supposed to do about it? Should you give up on those who reject Jesus? Should you give up on those who despise you because you are uh, some crazy person who believes in fairies in the sky or whatever they want to say about you? Well, look at what Jesus uh, responds, how he reacts. Uh, look at what he does. In verse 17, it tells us that Jesus knew their thoughts. Um, now, sometimes you and I are tempted to think that we, we uh, know the thoughts of other people or of each other, and sometimes that causes a lot of problems because we don't. Uh, sometimes we think that because we know their thoughts and their antagonism and just how impossible it is that the best thing that we can do is just to run away and chicken out, run for cover, uh, not say anything, be quiet. But Jesus actually does know their evil thoughts, but instead of responding either in vitriol to their vitriol or uh, running and hiding because he knows he hasn't got a, uh, a compliant audience. Uh, he answers their assertions and rebuffs their arguments. Uh, and, and how he does that is he asks some probing questions to drill down to their basic assumptions, doesn't he? Uh, okay, he says, 
Uh, so you say, I'm driving out demons by the power of Satan. Let me ask you two questions then. One, if I'm satanic, why do I want to fight against myself? Where is the logic of that? Uh, that doesn't make sense. If I am satanic, then I'm actually just leading to my own defeat. How can that be of any sense whatsoever? And then secondly, in verse 19, and if the way to cast out demons is to use the power of Satan, and if you and your sons, your followers, uh, cast out demons, uh, then are they using the power of Satan? Are they on Satan's side? Are you on Satan's side as well? Is that the logic of your argument? And so Jesus actually just forces them back onto their basic presumptions and assumptions and says, and where does that lead you to? In Darwin, during the uh, dry season, we would go to the markets every week and we had a, uh, a big poster that um, we would put uh, on the, the front of the table uh, and um, it was a, designed to be a discussion starter and, and often it was. Uh, sometimes people got very annoyed about it. Uh, but it's had, it was entitled The Four Miracles of Atheism. And if you look up The Four Miracles of Atheism, you'll probably find uh, that poster on the internet somewhere. And the four miracles of atheism are, one, getting something from nothing. Two, getting life from non-life. Three, getting order from chaos. Four, getting the immaterial from physical matter. And you see what that is trying to do is to do what Jesus is, say, is doing here, is to say, uh, let's go to your assumptions. And uh, the, the word miracles for atheism, I guess, is a little provocative. Um, and it's trying to say, but uh, so if you, if you are an atheist, if you don't believe in a supernatural power, uh, or that you believe more strongly that there is no such thing, then how do you explain the world in which we live? You say you're, you're dealing with everything from uh, a natural scientific order, but how can you get something from nothing? How can you get, when the, order, when the rules of science say that uh, we have increasing chaos, how can you get order out of that, etc., etc., etc.? And it's just going to a person's basic assumption, saying you ridicule us for believing in God. Well, to be an atheist, man, you've got to have a lot of faith, don't you? But Jesus doesn't just destroy their argument, but he presents the truth as well. And so first he said, let's examine the logic of your position and see that it doesn't stack up. Uh, so now I ask you, what would happen if you took the assumptions of my position? Where would that logic lead us to? And so he says in verse 20, but if, just humor me for a moment and consider it from this point of view, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, what then? And what are the implications of that? Now that expression, the finger of God, might strike you. It's not difficult to understand what he means. It's by God actually putting his finger on it and doing it. It's an expression that's not used anywhere else in the New Testament. It's uh, used, however, in the Old. It's used... Uh, of the finger of God that, um, that uh, gives the Ten Commandments, and it's given in a prior occasion of the finger of God on Moses in Exodus chapter 8. In the plague of the gnats, which comes on the Egyptians, the magicians try to replicate what Moses and Aaron did, but they cannot and they say in Exodus chapter 8 and verse 19, this is the finger of God. Again, it's not hard to understand what they mean, is it? This is the finger of God. This is what man cannot do, what we as magicians cannot do. This is the finger of God. This is the thing that God alone can do. Sadly, the response is actually the same as it is here for some of them in Luke chapter 11. Uh, reading on in Exodus 8 and verse 19, it says, But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen, just as the Lord had said. And so Jesus is clearly, clearly saying the same thing to these men, isn't it? 
These men who knew that story, who knew that expression, who knew where it came from. If this is the finger of God, he says, which allows me to expel a demon, then to reject the implications of this is to harden your hearts, not just, just against the carpenter's son, but against God, like Pharaoh did. And so the message to Pharaoh was to acknowledge that he should, he must acknowledge that Moses was the chosen deliverer of Israel uh, and that he could not resist the will and power of God. And the message to the opponents of Jesus is that Jesus is not just a small s saviour like Moses was, but that he is the saviour, that he is the one who can do this because he is acting and doing the things that God alone can do, that Moses was the shadower, shadow, but here is the deliverer for those who believe in him. And in him has come the kingdom of God. These things uh, in this time are being fulfilled amongst you, Theophilus, and the people of his day in Jesus. And to reject Jesus is to reject the finger of God, is to reject God himself. Within the, the uh, context and the flow of this passage, uh, in, in the early part of this chapter, uh, we have the Lord's Prayer presented to us. And in chapter 11 and verse 2, Jesus taught us to say, Your kingdom come. And that's not to be just the prayer of our lips, but the yearning of our hearts. And so Jesus is here demonstrating that the kingdom of God is there and coming, that that prayer is being fulfilled. But there are those who are spiritually mute, spiritually blind, unwilling to see the kingdom of God, even to, uh, unwilling to even admit its existence or its presence with them. And so while we pray for the coming in the future, when every knee shall bow before the Lord Jesus, there is a sense in which that the, the future fulfillment of that kingdom began with the coming of the Lord Jesus, began with the coming of God in the flesh, to be, the, to be one of us and to fulfill God's law for us, to die in the place uh, that we deserve to die, to rise as the first fruits of all who are united to him. And so this is, you see, all about Jesus. Jesus is the one who is, as we go on in the passage in verse 22, described as one who is someone stronger. There is someone who is strong, uh, who has things tied up according to his power, but then someone stronger comes along. And uh, that is, of course, Jesus. Even remember, again, referring to John the Baptist back in Luke chapter 3. Uh, John the Baptist says, uh, the people, or, or uh, Luke says about John the Baptist, the people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful, uh, the stronger one, more powerful than I will come the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then he speaks of his judgment. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Are you fearful of those who oppose the gospel? Are you fearful of those who might ridicule you for uh, your faith in the Lord Jesus? Well, don't you know, the Lord Jesus is stronger. The Lord Jesus is stronger than John the Baptist. The Lord Jesus is stronger than you. He's stronger than me. He's stronger than the church. He is stronger than the devil. The Lord Jesus is stronger. And if you are his child, then that strength is working with you and for you. And there is here, isn't there, a very strong call for action. Uh, calling to account and all that happens and all that Jesus says here. Uh, even still in those words, the finger of God. Uh, the finger of God uh, points at Pharaoh. 
and that's the hardening of his heart. It points at these people who are questioning the uh, integrity of Jesus. It puts them on the spot. And then these warnings are crystallized in verse 23, where Jesus says, uh, listen, people, there is no middle ground here. We cannot just sort of argue a halfway compromise position, but you are either with the Lord Jesus or you are indeed with Satan. And then he goes on to explain in verses 24 to 26 uh, that they have been witnesses of a great sign. <clears throat> but just as that uh, evil demon was dismissed, if they are witnesses of that sign but then they don't do anything about it, then they are leaving themselves liable to much worse than what this poor man had suffered in the past. But Satan, if they do not accept Jesus, has a, has a free run with them. But Jesus wants to offer something much more, something much more wonderful. And so he offers to them uh, blessing and life. And so he finishes with that wonderful promise in verse 28, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And clearly, of course, he's to say the obvious. He's, he is claiming that he speaks the word of God uh, because he is the word of God, God himself. Uh, the sign has pointed to that. It has become obvious in what has been happening. And so here in the midst of, of a hatred, of ridicule, of derision, of being vilified, Jesus isn't withdrawing and saying, oh, well, you know, poor old me. Uh, they're not nice to me. At my, that's uh, the place where I've come to speak to them and I've tried to be kind, but nobody loves me. But he's there with that bold recognition that you and I can have that God's kingdom has come and is coming. And in his kingdom, there is security. And in his kingdom, there is power. And in his kingdom, there is beauty and blessing and joy. Remember that joy that we spoke of last time that Jesus had at, in uh, chapter 10. It's not easy to be ridiculed for your faith, but this is a normal part of life for a Christian. And for all uh, our brothers and sisters throughout the world who are undergoing similar kinds of suffering. And remember what Jesus said. Again in Luke chapter 6 and verses 22 and 23. He said, blessed are you when men hate you. When they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day. And leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their fathers treated the prophets. We don't live in unique times, do we? Uh, from the time of the prophets, to, from the time of Jesus himself. Uh, we live in times when we as God's people are in fact blessed and derided. Uh, we're not persecuted like uh, our brothers and sisters in many parts of the world are persecuted, uh, not with that intensity at this point in time, but we have that same blessing. We are in the blessed position of being children of God, people who have God's word in our hands, who have the truth presented to us. There's no need to be intimidated by the world and its opposition as though this is a new experience that nobody else, ever else has had to cope with before. Uh, Satan might loom and seem like a strong man, but Jesus is the stronger man. And our delight is that as always, as those in other parts of the world where the persecution is intense, as our forebears in the faith, as the Lord Jesus himself, we, are, we can be secure and bold, and no need to uh, fly off the handle and be reactive and defensive, but just secure and trust and confident because of the Lord Jesus, because of him, and he is the victory, to rejoice in the blessing of being a child of God. Let's pray together. 
Oh Lord, so often the uh, events and the, the actions of this world do loom large in our mind and, and often we feel so small and powerful and, and intimidated by these things. But we give, pray, Lord, that you would give us a, a deep and holy contentment and boldness and encouragement that you are the almighty God, that your plans are not overcome, uh, that you are the one who is victorious over all things, that your kingdom has come. We have seen the signs in the Lord Jesus and that we can have uh, utter confidence in you. Oh Lord, we pray for those with whom we work and mix. Uh, we pray that those who have, within our families even, who have uh, blindness uh, of spirit and mind towards you, that their eyes might be opened, that they might see the wonder of the Lord Jesus, the only Saviour. And so, Father, we pray these things and uh, pray that we might be encouraged in them uh, for your glory to live as your own. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen.